Well, hello everyone. It's 4.01, even though it should have been four o'clock, but that's okay. We are all here together. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, forgot my manners. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here and welcome, welcome, welcome to our Spring Symposium 2022. Uh, together with all of you lovely people uh, who are, have given up your Friday afternoons, you know, we could have been shopping at Costco or probably at our favorite restaurant, you know, with our family catching up on what has happened in the past couple of days. But but we really appreciate you sharing this time with us. Um, it, I am Ron, Dr. Rhonda Agito, the co-chair, together with my partner, Dr. Lynn Hamer, uh, who's also the co-chair of the committee. And we genuinely are looking forward to covering the ground, some of it old, some of it new, but all of it of critical importance to our world of the 21st century of education. So with that 30 second summary, we can move on to opening remarks by our distinguished Dean Raymond Witte. But first, let me ask you that you ensure that your microphones are muted before we begin. Dean Witte. Uh, welcome everyone. I apologize for being late. Um, this is like my fifth try to get in. Uh, I was thinking, okay, first, second, uh, fifth time I thought, hey, maybe I uh, upset Rhonda and she is just locking me out. Um, so I I got in, so thank you all. I will be brief um, so that we can really get to uh, why we're all here. Uh, first of all, welcome to the second annual Judith Herb College of Education Spring Symposium. Uh, this year's symposium is centered around cultural competency. Uh, the collective activities today and tomorrow are all due to the hard work and dedication of the diversity committee within the college. Uh, I would like to thank them publicly for shepherding this important college event. And in particular, please bear with me as I go through the names, but they are very important people uh, moving this work forward. Uh, without question, we have our co-chairs, uh, Dr. Rhonda Aguiton and Dr. Lynn Hamer. Uh, I believe Aaron Baker is on the call as well, as well as Amira Archer, uh, Suzanne Garza, uh, Dr. Natasha Johnson, uh, Dr. Rathi Kumar, uh, Dr. S uh, Dale Snart, uh, Snowart is here. Uh, Dr. Colleen Fitzpatrick and Dr. Christine Fox um, helped along the way, as well as friends um, who are not actually part of the committee. Uh, that would be uh, Ms. Taylor Yarborough and Mr. Josh Beals. Um, they do obviously very important yeoman work in getting all that done. Um, uh, all of this is from a collective effort, as you can well imagine. Um, they have worked diligently to find excellent speakers, participants, and exercises to help facilitate important conversation as well as needed action. As educators, we are all about learning uh, and life learning in particular, uh, developing greater awareness, awareness and understanding of culture, life experience, and universality is why we are all here today and why we educate future generations of learners. For everyone in attendance, thank you for taking time out of your busy life schedule to share your time, talents, and thoughts as we continue to learn and grow together. Uh, as I said, I promise to keep my remarks short, which I have. So without further delay, I would like to turn the virtual stage back over to Rhonda. Oh, Thank you, Dean Whitty. Thank you so much uh, for pointing the way forward, which is so important. And I want to take this opportunity to remind you that we are going to have an exciting time over the next two hours. So brace yourself and hold on to your chair. So we'd like to move on to the next item on the agenda. Um, I think we have, I'm not sure, but before we do, I hand over um, the microphone to uh, the co-chair, Dr. Hamer. Um, I believe we have our special guests on. Do we have all our special guests on? For the panel. I'm sorry, you were expecting me to answer, weren't you? 
I'm just checking, and I believe that possibly we are still gathering. We're we are already running a little bit ahead of time, so okay. um, maybe we can just have a we can, we can socialize. Moment. We we were going to have a virtual happy hour with mingling, so maybe yeah. people can just speak amongst themselves for a few minutes. We did send the agenda out, so I don't want to get started ahead of time because then people will miss out. So. That's fine. Just uh, relax and speak amongst ourselves. Dean, what do you? Mike is off. I'm sorry. Uh, I said I can confabulate uh, for as long as you need me to. Uh, oh, that'd be great. <laughs> deans are famous for doing that. Um, I was uh, I was talking to uh, uh, Judy Herb today, just prior to this meeting. And she said, you don't want to hear this, Ray, but it's 81 degrees where I'm at. And then there was this pause and I said, no, I really don't want to hear that it's 81 degrees where you're at. She said, well, I'll be coming back to the cold weather. Uh, I told her that we had um, kind of 60s, right? Middle 60s, teased at around 70. And then I shared with her, and I think we're supposed to get some snow flurries, maybe some snow this weekend. So that's that's the cruelness of, of northern Ohio. You get teased, and it's like, yeah, that's spring. And then not yet. You know, it's a it's a nice preview, but it's oh so short. It's kind of like the trailer to a movie. You know, you get real excited, and then it's like, Oh, no, can't see it yet. So um, she wished uh, everyone well. I, I don't know if she'll be able to join us today. I'm hoping she'll be able to join us tomorrow. Um, I don't think she'll be in transit anywhere, but I'm not sure about that. But she did uh, ask me to give everyone well wishes. Um, she thought obviously today's um, meeting is obviously very important. Um, and um, she participated in last year's work as well. So uh, she does take this very seriously um, and um, was appreciative of everyone's efforts. So uh, I just wanted to share that um, uh, for every for the group. My cousin in Toronto sent a picture of uh, almost a foot of snow. That's what they woke up to in Toronto. So I told him to, if he can kindly keep the snow up there and not send those flurries that we're supposed to get later tonight. It was already cold today. I couldn't believe I had to pull out gloves. So yeah. yeah, he thought it was April Fools actually. Well, you know, I Toronto, okay. Uh, <laughs> I, I kind of get that or, you know, kind of upper New York, Maine, yeah. You don't get you don't get spring for a long time. It's true, but you know, northern Ohio, yeah, come on. <laughs> oh boy, Amira, how school? Um, like my school or my how school teacher. has been how yeah how has teaching been for the past three I'm years? actually I'm finishing my chapter five right before oh. this meeting I have one like three more paragraphs and then I'm gonna send it to my oh. advisor and then my school with my students that's going really well too yeah yeah although I did take a half day today and I was leaving and my kids are like where are you going and I was like, uh, uh, in my head, I'm like, to finish this chapter five. But I was like, um, see you guys on Monday. <laughs> but they're doing well. Oh, well, good. It's, it's nice to be missed. Yes, it is. When you have high school students who don't want you to leave, who want you to stay in the classroom, that's a compliment, you yeah. know? Oh, big time. Take that. Oh, yeah. Oh. Yeah, when I was working in the schools, they definitely knew when you were there and they definitely knew when you were not there and mm -hmm. usually you would get the third degree um you know where were you i didn't see you in the hall so it's like absolutely uh, they all want to know where i'm going and what i'm doing 
I'm like, you guys know I don't live at this school, right? I have a real home and I have a name. My first name is not Mrs. I actually have a name and a family and everything. <laughs> yeah, well, it, when you're in the building, they are your family and you are to be accountable at all times. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Remember. Can't oh, really? wait to read those chapters, Amara. <laughs> ah, sounds like a hint, hint. <laughs> I you know, recall I think... writing chapter five feels a little bit like when I'm tired of telling stories to my kid. <laughs> and they all lived happily after after the end. <laughs> That's how I feel. <laughs> oh, boy. So I must do a little promo, right? You've got to look at the Tuesday night show called Abbott Elementary, if anyone has seen it. And if you haven't, I'd, let you, I'd like to remind you or introduce you and do a little promo. Abbott Elementary is an amazing comedy. They got A plus from Rotten Tomatoes. So let me make that very clear to everyone. Um, it is the writer is also the star of the show. And if you don't catch it on a Tuesday night, you can catch it on Hulu. Mm -hmm. Find it on Hulu. Check it out. Albert Elementary. If anybody remembers, remembers the show called Chris Rock. Not Chris Rock. Oh my gosh, did I say Chris Rock? Oh no. See what's <laughs> happening there? See what's happening there? Oh boy. Everybody hates Chris, the star, and everybody hates Chris. He's on it. Um I'm talking about Abbott Elementary. Yeah. Yes. Great show. Gotta watch it. It's good. It's about an inner city school in Philadelphia, and they touch on, I think, almost every topic, you know, that we face in schools today. It's really good. It's really good. And I think that we are all gathered, and if you want, we could get started with our introductions. Um, uh, if, if you want to go ahead back to the program after that nice little virtual mingling. <laughs> all right. So we want to hand over to you, Dr. Hammer. Would you yes, like me to introduce you? Would go ahead so you can back up. Okay, so uh, this is the wrong here. Let, Rhonda, yeah. if you take that one down, I, I can share from this side. There we go. All right, so welcome. Again, my name is Lynn Hamer. I'm so glad to be here. I will look, will linger on this first slide for a minute while I tell you that my pronouns are she, her, and I've been here at the University of Toledo for 26 years. So both my grown children are native Toledoans, and the panel of people that we have here today are representative of the reason that we love Toledo. My kids absolutely love Toledo. So I am very honored to get to be the moderator today for these wonderful people. Um, so we'll start out. Fadi Sarsour is also a Toledo native. He is representing the Islamic Network Group Midwest. Fadi is a UT alum. As I mentioned, he was born and raised in Toledo. He's a second generation Palestinian American Muslim. He's been in the field of education for nine years and currently is assistant principal at Toledo Islamic Academy. He's a member of Masjid Saad's interfaith committee and he is involved in many interfaith dialogues. Fadi enjoys reading, hiking with his wife and daughter and rooting for the Liverpool football club as well as the Detroit Pistons. So thank you for being with us, Fadi. We look forward to hearing from you. Let's have our next slide. Oh, I'm doing them, aren't I? Rawe Schumann. My uh, friendship with Rawe Schumann goes back two decades. I've been counting. He is here representing the Toledo Kwanzaa House. Rawe was born and raised in Jacksonville, Florida. He is a US Army Vietnam era veteran. Rawe received his Bachelor of Science in Cell Biology from San Francisco State University. And Mr. Schumann taught science and math in Toledo Public Schools for more than 20 years. 
He has been recognized as TPS Adult Education Teacher of the Year and twice as UT Upward Bound's Mary McLeod Bethune Educator of the Year. He was also recognized as a Kwanzaa pioneer by the Toledo Lucas County Public Libraries. Mr. Schumann served two terms as Toledo Alliance of Black School Educators president. He has also served as director of Europe at UT, as adjunct professor of anatomy and physiology at medical college, and as math and science consultant with a special education emphasis for UT and TPS. So thank you for being here. Our third panelist is Taylor Bursiaga. Taylor is executive director of the Sophia Quintero Art and Cultural Center. Taylor grew up in the old south end of Toledo, and after graduating from Bowling Green State University, she stayed in the area to continue her community involvement. Taylor has been part of the nonprofit industry for over 15 years. Her past involvement includes Viva South CDC, the Toledo Cultural Arts Center, the Maumee Chamber of Commerce, and now the Sophia Quintero Arts and Cultural Center, which works to share Latino culture through art, cooking, and gardening and is open to the community and public. In addition to her nonprofit background, Taylor's past career involvement also includes event planning in the Toledo City Council. She now serves on a variety of community groups, including the Toledo Land Bank and the Broadway Corridor Coalition. So Taylor, thank you for being with us. Our fourth panelist, Stuart James, is the executive director of the Ability Center of Tele I'm sorry, the Ability Center in Sylvania, our neighbor. His philosophy is that normal is everyone, and that we all possess talents, skills, qualities, and responsibilities that contribute to our communities. Previously, Stewart served as the executive director at the historic Center for Independent Living in Berkeley. Stewart has a master's degree from the New York Institute of Technology, and he was a graduate assistant of their nationally ranked lacrosse program. He then spent more than 20 years as an executive in the sports and entertainment industry, living and working across four continents. Stewart is a diehard fan at this point of Toledo Mud Hens and the University of Toledo Rockets. So thank you for being with us. And finally, our fifth panelist is Sheena Barnes. Sheena is a youth mentor and activist. Sheena's pronouns are she, her, and they, them. Sheena and her three children have been planted Toledoans for almost 15 years, having relocated from Flint, Michigan. Sheena's background is in informed trauma care and community organizing. Her educational career has been in psychology, and she is currently pursuing her sociology degree at the University of Toledo. Sheena was the director of Equality Toledo for two years and currently sits on the Toledo Public Schools Board of Education. She also currently is a representative on many boards, including Buckeye Flame, Boy Scouts of America, and ABLE. She is also a member of the National Black Justice Coalition Good Trouble Network. And thank you for being here, Sheena. So I'm going to stop sharing now so that we can um, see our panelists as they speak. And uh, just to sort of review how this will go, we're, we're doing a panel in which each of the panelists will be asked the same question and given about four minutes, up to four minutes to answer. I will be keeping time and I will try not to be too rude, but I will flash my cell phone with a bing, 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 bing when your time is up because we do want to keep things moving along. So I apologize ahead of time and I will be equally rude to all. How's that? Um, so uh, our first question, and, and I think we'll do this first round in the order in which you were introduced and then we'll mix it up a little bit. So uh, our first round contestants is how do you define cultural competence? And Fadi, we'll start with you. Oh, great. So uh, I get to start off with all the pressure. <laughs> uh, thank you uh, again for inviting me to participate on this panel. Um, cultural competency, I think, is a very uh, broad term. 
I think uh, the main things that I would say define cultural competency are building awareness that there are people uh, uh, that have different beliefs and different values, different morality than you. Uh, building that awareness and then gaining knowledge about other cultures. Uh, and, and, and if you don't know about your own culture, building, building the knowledge about your own culture too, and uh, being inclusive and respecting uh, all groups. I have to get used to unmuting. I'm so sorry, but thank you. <laughs> uh, Rahway, would you like to give us your thoughts? Yes, um, I would echo what Fadi said. Um, so cultural competence uh, simply means to meet acceptance and respect for cultural differences. And cultural competence is a continuum. It's not an isolated That cultural competence continuum has five stages that we all need to be aware of. And the first is the most nest or deculturalization. And uh, some examples of that would be slavery, um, cultural thievery, appropriating another culture as your own, such as claiming that Elvis Presley is the king of rock and roll when. African American baby boomers would say Chuck Berry and Little Richard are the kings of rock and roll. So, cultural thievery is a very real form of uh, cultural destruction. Jim Crow laws lynching, those are all examples of uh, cultural destructiveness. The second stage is incapacitance. You either won't or you can't do anything about cultural destruct destructiveness. Uh, and that's where a lot of people are. The third stage is honest introspection, which means you look, you take a look, an honest look inside yourself. Don't lie to yourself. And if you see biases, try to remove them. The fourth stage is awareness, appreciation, and value of different cultures. That's approaching cultural competence. But there's one more stage beyond cultural competence, and that is cultural proficiency. Cultural proficiency holds other cultures in high esteem equal to one's own culture. Individuals and institutions use this view to guide all other interactions with people of different cultures. So I want to conclude my remarks, my first remarks, by saying that cultural competence has a dual nature. It can be applied to individuals and institutions such as UT. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. So let's hear now, Taylor. Would you share your ideas of how do you define cultural comp cultural competence? Sure. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay. Using a new mic, so I want to make sure. Um, so I first have to agree with the first two speakers. Um, when I was doing some research, it is a very very broad concept. Um, that has a lot to kind of take into part in the notes that I put which is um, similar to the comment is I put, it's kind of an ever evolving process, the continuum. There's not a start and a stop to it. And I think as humans, our nature is to want that start and stop and it's not there. You will constantly be on, on the wheel of trying to learn and, and adopt. Um, cultural competence, I put it in two factors. I put it first, it's a respect and awareness of yourself and others as far as culture, beliefs, background, traits, the list can go on and on. But I really made sure to highlight yourself because that's just as important as being aware as it is to the others. And then the second part in that respect and awareness is taking that respect and awareness and learning how to be proactive and effective with it. So not just learning about it and being aware, but really pushing into the next phase of what are we gonna do with that? And in a proactive approach is how I define it. Thank you. We're, we're getting a lot of sort of themes going here. And I'll just remind people we'll have a chance to have discussion after after this panel. So if you're taking notes, I know I am. 
Um, so let's see, we've heard from Taylor Stewart. Um, I am not actually seeing you here yet, but I'm hoping you are. Stuart James. Huh. Okay, so I'm uh, I'm afraid that Mr. James, I hope he has not had trouble getting on or some other trouble, but we'll we'll try to um, see if we can find find him. Um, Sheena, would you give us your ideas on cultural competence? Sure. I thought going first would be scary. I think <laughs> at the short end. Um I was trying to make sure I didn't get too uh wordy with it. And so I think all is just pretty much embracing and engaging one or a community in their roots and that's in your roots too without getting the weeds and then i'll get to that more in the next questions because i think that's something um that we get stuck in focusing on this is what i know this is what i learned about this community this person uh, this culture um that we forget the identity of that person so overall is pretty much is the the marathon, not the race, the marathon to embrace one's uh, roots and their community and, and their family and their religion, their traditions, um, without getting in the weeds. I have a thing going. I promise. <laughs> those were those were short and sweet and to the point. And now we're ready, as Sheena says, to get a little bit further into the weeds. So um, let's let's go on with our second question. Um, so each of you serves or mentors or is affiliated with a different what, what might be called a different demographic group. Um, and so we'd like you as as you've been prompted, we'd like you in this case to think about the group that you are here representing the youth and the families that you serve and that you mentor. What would it mean to be culturally competent? for those youth and their families. And so we're thinking in terms of as teachers and educators, we need to understand from the youth and the family's point of view, what cultural competence would mean. Uh, and you might wanna remind us what, what uh, group you work with most, the like introduction went by fast. So um, I think, how about if this time we go in the order of Taylor, Sheena, Fadi, and then Rawe, is that okay? Yes. Sounds good. Taylor, Taylor, will you, oops, Taylor, will you start us off? All right. So I work at the Sophia Quintero Art and Cultural Center, which is based in the old south end of Toledo. Just to give everyone just a really quick background, um, the old south end of Toledo currently, unfortunately, um, is the highest amount of concentrated poverty in the entire city of Toledo. Um, unemployment rates um, and just obstacles. It is considered a food desert as well and limited to no access to fresh produce and food. Um, as a nonprofit, we're actually a cultural center and we focus on the Latino culture, but over the years that we have been here, the Old South End has really integrated into three major groups, Caucasian, Latinos, and African-Americans. When we started, it didn't look like that. It was kind of the most Latinos in an in a area, and now the three groups have really spread, which means the people that we work with has also changed a great deal. Um, so what does it mean to be culturally competent for youth and families whom I work with? So one um, I put is really to just be open and I put kind of a note to have a mentality that this is a, not the situation where one size fits all. Um, you don't want to go in with a generalization approach that, you know, the whatever I'm bringing to the table is effective and proactive for everyone in that group. But in order for me to really accept that, I need to be open minded on, you know, just how others, I say, do way of life um, and making sure that um, we're having those conversations. I'm in the nonprofit world and there's kind of this. I can't remember, there's a short saying, but there's a danger zone where nonprofits get into. It's pretty much when you're a nonprofit, what you don't want to do is identify a community that's having problems and come in and say, we're going, we have all these policies and programs and now we're here to fix you. That's not what we need. And nonprofits fall into that danger a lot. It's not where the constituents are here and the nonprofit is over here and we have this layer to put on top of them that all of a sudden, if, if you follow our services and programs, all will be good and all will be fixed. That's not what, 
that's not how we want to do. And so being open, I kind of symbolize is really that integration where we're both even and we have to figure out how to kind of mesh together. Um, but being open is really the first step or you will have an obstacle and barrier in the next steps that you're going to do. Um, the next part I put is just willing to learn. Um, most people, what I have found, um, will take Dia de los Muertos, Day of the Dead. Most people do not like traditions or events because they don't understand them. It's not in their context. Nothing wrong with it. They just don't know about it. And usually there is a defense where if I don't know about it, I don't like it. Um, and so there's kind of that, I would say, to be to be culturally competent for youth and families is just bringing that willingness to learn. Usually, if there's a willingness to learn, what will shortly follow is a willingness to accept. Doesn't mean that you have to, you know, necessarily support and follow. Those are different things, but a willingness to learn usually follows with a willingness to accept. And again, that really breaks down a lot of other barriers. And then the last part I put um, is adapting. And I'm kind of referencing my definition of what I said it means to be culturally competent is it's a two-step process for me. It's not just an internal about learning and identifying, observing, but it's also how can I proactively do something with what I'm learning. So to adapt our policies, our programs, our services, maybe for teachers, classroom, curriculum, things like that. But once I get that information, how can I adapt it to improve what, you know, whatever it may be working on or their overall quality of life? And I wrote one note just to wrap up. Um, you know, I kind of remember there's that saying where, you know, there's comfort in when you kind of hear people say, well, that's just the way we do things around here. Well, that may only be comforting for that one person. I think it's important for remember the way of doing things is not always comfortable for everybody. And so I think that's a good part to remember. So I'll end with that. that I, I don't have notes, Taylor. You're making me look bad. <laughs> I'll get off topic if I don't. <laughs> but I'm winging it. I'm winging it. Um, but overall, I serve and advocate for the LGBTQ plus community here in Lucas County um, and surrounding areas. Um, and the one thing that I know for sure that it means is something that I would say that's most beneficial to that community, to our community, is to uh, be able to understand and I and and acknowledge the multiple identifications in that community. Um, a lot of people forget that there are other identifications or identifiers that we have to also navigate in life. And for a, a great example, I'm working to do a black and brown support group for parents of LGBTQ because it's that struggle of, okay, my kid is gay, now what? And a lot of people go, just love them. Like, duh, get over yourself, which is great. Yeah, but you have to understand the history, especially of, of enslaved African descent, descent, descendants of enslaved Africans and how um, that ties into the homophobia, homophobia that we see in our community and what that mean for that parent. And then for therefore what that means for that child who may can't come out because it's not a safe space and how do that religion plays into it. So it's a lot of different levels that ties into the identifiers of these individuals in our community. Um, our spaces are, you know, very diverse, you know, um, but if you walk in focusing only on the queer aspect of it, you're going to lose half for your crowd. Um, so being able to walk in and say, okay, I thank you for sharing, or I noticed this identifier in my head, but also tell me more. What what else? What else? Like keep pulling those layers apart because by then you're really embracing that whole person. You're not uh like society decompartmentalizing them and putting them in the little box of this, what you know about them. And this is what you feel about them, because that's how you get into the weeds, which is AKA stereotypes or stigmas or implicit bias. So you have to really do the work. A lot of people are afraid to do the work because they don't want to get it wrong. But if you work with that person and listen, um, then you will be able to understand why some of these things are different and we're going to get into that question next of the barriers that they they face because of these things 
um, and how to best navigate them as an advocate, as an ally. I say accomplice because allies take breaks, accomplice do the work, um, and then help that person, you know, become the person they want to become, be free, be open, you know, be proud to be queer in this, in that, and, you know, other things like that. Thank you so much. I like the accomplices do the work. Uh, let's hear now if we could from Fadi, your thoughts. Yeah, I represent the um, uh, in, uh, Islamic network groups. Uh, I'm the assistant principal currently at the Toledo Islamic Academy off of Alexis Road. Um, luckily for me, the media did a great job representing us uh, in the past 20 years. <laughs> That's a little bit of sarcasm. Uh, but I would like to start off with explaining what a Muslim is. Uh, so a Muslim is just someone that submits their will to one God, their creator. And that creator sent messages through uh, different people such as Abraham, Moses, Jesus, and the final one, Muhammad, with instructions for the creation. And this one uh, this 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 one God that a Muslim submits to is is a indivisible, uh, self sustaining entity uh, that has no gender, that uh, that isn't human, that doesn't give birth, and nothing gave birth to this entity, this essence, and and that's that's all a Muslim is. Is they believe in that one Creator and the messengers that the Creator sent, and what was in those messages, such as a Muslim believes in the Torah, uh, the original Torah, believes in the uh, original gospel, uh, and then the final revelation in the Quran. Now, the reason why I started with all that is because that's all it is. <laughs> Everything else you see is, um, there's different levels of practice. There are some people that follow the dietary restrictions. There are some women that wear the headscarf, some that do not. Uh, there are people that pray five times a day. There are others that do not. Uh, uh, at sunset tonight is the mark of uh, our month, uh, holy month Ramadan, where we'll observe a 30 day, 29 or 30 day fast from true dawn to sunset every day. Uh, so the reason why I gave that definition of a Muslim, and, and, and that's, that's the general acceptance of what a Muslim is, is because Muslims come from all over the place. Uh, there are so many nationalities, languages, cultures. Uh, there, there are some that are European American, African American, Latino American, Arab American. We represent the world. The the, cult, the the community that I work with has literally from every background, uh, and every ethnicity, every language, in one place. And the reason why was, this question was so difficult for me was because. It, I cannot put a blanket statement of what cultural competence for this group is because there are there are so many groups being represented. So, and because there are so many groups being represented, we have we have to treat each each group as an individual. So, uh, for instance, I'm a second generation uh, American, but if we trace my daughter from my wife's end, uh, she's a fifth generation American. So we have everything from refugees to about seventh generation Americans to people uh, having the sense here that they cannot even uh, fathom when it began. So uh, being culturally competent for a Muslim group, you really have to you really have to get to know them individually. We have people that speak Urdu, uh, Swahili, uh, Arabic, English. So many, so many different things about them that make them different, and we celebrate those differences. Uh, I would say a general. Uh, with, with that said, some small things that I hear uh, parents say, uh, or what I've what I've witnessed with my eyes is, if someone speaks a different language, is a uh, different language than than us. Uh, if their native tongue is not English, they're not less educated than you. Uh, there's a lot of times where their opinions and uh, their thoughts and uh, or, or their input gets pushed aside because they do not sound like us. Uh, 
So there, there, there's that. Uh, in the public school systems, I, 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 uh, I would, I would personally like to do a survey, a study to see how many uh, Muslim leaders are represented in our public school system. Uh, I can't think of many from the top of my head, uh, let alone a woman that wears a headscarf. I don't know how many women that wear headscarves are represented in our school districts, let alone a principal or a superintendent. Uh, so, and, and, and I think one of my students that, that, that are interested in going into education, they said, she said to me that I don't, I don't think, I don't think the U.S. is ready for uh, a, a principal to wear a headscarf. And that made me kind of sad to hear because this is a, this is a 15 year old telling me that I don't think the US is ready to see uh, a principal or superintendent in a headscarf in a public school system. Uh, so I would say being culturally competent is uh, understanding that, that Muslims come from many different groups, many different ethnicities, uh, many different nationalities uh, that they, they're, they have many cultures within, and then there's hybrid cultures. They're, do not assume that because someone is a second generation American and their parents are immigrants, that that student fully does what their, or sorry, that individual does fully what their parents do, uh, or they have the same exact beliefs of their parents or their friends or even their siblings. So it was a very tough question for me to just, uh, to give a blanket, uh, definition of what cultural competence is. And I think it's, I would say it's better to know the groups individually and learn it from the right sources. Uh, I am, like I mentioned, the assistant principal of Toledo Islamic Academy. And I, I invite anyone that is in the education field to reach out to me and we can, we can place you and get experience with our community. Thank you. Oops. Thank you so much. Oh, I'm sorry. I can't get this turned up. Okay. Um, Robert. Yes. Um, well, I I think that the culturally competent teacher or professor treats African American students and parents fairly and with dignity and respect. The culturally competent teacher or professor does not fall prey to what Dr. Claus Steele calls stereotype threat. That is, ascribing negative stereotypic behavior, such as low intellectual ability to African American students. The culturally competent teacher or professor should realize that the overwhelming majority of African American students are the victims of 12 plus years of a vastly inferior education system. The culturally competent teacher or professor should understand the culture, history, and language of African American students. The culturally competent teacher or professor should empathize with the African American experience. There is an adage that says, if you want to understand someone, you walk a mile in their shoes. An African American proverb says, who feels it knows it, Lord. So to be culturally competent would mean what most of the other speakers said, to immerse yourself in other people's culture to try to understand it. Um, so that's what I think cultural competence means for a teacher or a professor. Thank you so much. You are all giving us a lot to think about. I just want to put a shout out because it is difficult. Um, online. Uh, Mr. Stuart James, were you able to get in and join us? Yeah, I don't, I'm not sure what happened. I thought, I hope everything is okay with Mr. James because um, I thought we had set up. So, he was online, wasn't he with us? I, I am, I am not sure. I can't say I thought it. I heard I, him. Uh, go ahead. Oh, is that at the ability center? Yes. Did I you see I heard him? Okay. Well, if anyone notices Mr. James come in and I don't notice, please speak up. Um, uh, it's technology is always iffy, isn't it? <laughs> All right. So, so with that little brief pause here, 
Um, we'll go on to our third round and, and we're doing very well with time. So if people want to relax a little bit and expand and maybe if, if you have personal experiences that you would like to share or um, specific observations, we can, uh, we're doing very well. So um, uh, this next one does get us into the weeds a little further. So um, what kinds of problems or barriers with cultural competence do the youth and family whom you serve encounter? So in other words, um, how have you observed that sometimes teachers and professors are not as culturally competent as we need to be? Um, and uh, how, how can we learn from that? So uh, let's, with this one, we'll start if it's okay with Sheena, and then we'll go to Rawe, Taylor, and end with Fadi. So actually, this is the weeds I like to get into because one of the, I'm gonna say one of the problems how we get to the barriers that sometimes uh, our school systems or institutions uh, put up for our groups that we're representing. Um, but Brother Fadi, actually, I just wanted to say when you said that, it kind of hurt me that she she felt that she didn't see herself. But I want to let you know because of the, one of the things I wanted to talk about was the media. The media is a cisgender, heterosexual, white Christian entity that will only show you the stereotypes of that group and you will probably never see that a sister or a a woman a, a, a you know a female identified person wearing a hijab as a principal but i tell you i know i know she's out there um so please keep encouraging her and if if not please encourage her to be the first and you know and definitely check tps as well because we are growing in it so i don't want to think i was stepping back from that because it, it's it's something that we're starting to see where as we are learning about ourselves and learning about the first person and learning about history because we're teaching the truth or fighting and advocating, see what I did or Dr. Hamer, teaching the truth um, and making sure we're able to do that in our schools regardless of what uh, some people feel is uncomfortable for them or divisive, you will start seeing that those barriers are gonna be broken because now we're talking about these things. And a lot of the barriers that uh, exist for any community, but also the LGBT community, because I'm focusing on that, that's my that's my lane, um, is because of what is portrayed about us. You see only the nice fit, shaped, skinny, sexual, uh, not heterosexual, sorry, cisgender male. And trust me, we're out there, we're fluffy, we're, we're moms, we're, you know, we are bears, we are so much more than that, but because of that's what they're comfortable with and their narrative is fit more with that, that's what they're going to show you. Um, so when I walk into a space as a proud black queer woman and they look at me and go, wait, you, you're doing all this, you're doing too much, but then I also say that it's a sad thing that I made history. I shouldn't be the first black queer woman to be on a school board that we know of in Ohio or Northwest Ohio. That's sad, but did y'all know about that? No, because that does not fit the narrative of what queer people uh, are capable of. You know, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of our community has been reduced to only sex. Um, when we are talking or we're we're getting into these conversations, we are the deviants. We're the freaks. Um, it gives barriers to what our education system can talk about. Uh, when we're talking about LGBT youth, I mean, we're talking about bills. I'm going to bring up the don't say gay bill was based off of these barriers portrayed by stereotypes, implicit bias, and, and that's now going to hinder those those students education. Um, here we have uh, an anti trans bill that's going to hinder hinder health care. And that's the barriers created by implicit bias stereotypes that portrayed by being honest, Kali, uh, cl uh, colonialism and white supremacy. So, um, and those are just the, the tip birds that we're fighting right now for the problems and barriers. I don't know how much time I've got, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was, one minute, okay. You have another minute, Sheena. You have another minute. <laughs> I got a minute, okay, I was doing good. So, <laughs> so then we're talking about the multiple, uh, the multiple identities when we're getting in that when we're as teachers, I know it's kind of the, the next question, but when we're engaging as teachers or future educators, 
remember to check your implicit bias. And I know we hear that a hundred times, but you'll be so surprised when, you know, people ask me, wait, you're, you're queer, you're gay, but how do you have kids? You know, um, they so focus once again on what they're, they know, uh, what they're seeing, um, and what they're represented. Um, and this is why we actually have uh, black trans women getting murdered at a higher rate because when we are thinking about the media, and I want y'all to do this as a little exercise for y'all. When y'all thinking about the media, thinking about movies, music, whatever, when you see a, a male identified person in a dress uh, for comedy or for horror. So it takes away that humanity of trans folks, especially black trans women. Um, so once again, these are barriers that are created by the narrative that's pushed out there. Nice, thank you. Let's see, uh, Rawe, what kinds of barriers do you see? Well, I see African Americans continually facing stage one and stage two of the cultural competence curriculum uh, um, continuum. That is cultural destructiveness and incapacitance or indifference. Um, and we face that uh, daily. Um, basically cultural destructiveness, deculturalization, and we face that for over 403 years daily, every day of our lives in America. For me, the number one barrier or obstacle of African Americans is systemic racism, which is America's congenital birth defect. America was born with racism and has not been able to shake it in 400 years, and I don't think it ever will shake it. Some examples of systemic racism are police brutality, which is obvious, inferior education, housing and employment. Something that many people don't realize, the black tax. You're taxed in America for being black. Black people on average pay more for goods and services in our neighborhood than any other group. If you go in the black neighborhood to a gas station, the gas prices will be higher. And if you go to a grocery store in a black neighborhood, the grocery prices will be higher. Why? Because poor people are exploited. Those people know that poor people don't have a car and they can't go to Kroger where they would get a better deal. Therefore, they must go to the community grocery store or they must take a cab to the community grocery store. So this is definitely exploitation of black people. Um, the, the prices in our neighborhoods, as I said, are always higher. Gas, grocery, you name it. Um, medical racism is another daily obstacle that black people face in America. Uh, I don't have to remind you of the Tuskegee experiment where they experiment on black men, infected them with syphilis, or they had syphilis and did not treat them. They observed them to see the effects and the um, longevity, the, the uh, outcome of syphilis. This was cruel and inhuman. And uh, most black people know about that and therefore we distrust the medical system. You probably also heard of Henrietta Lacks. Her cells were used to create a billion dollar cancer research industry and her family has yet to receive, I think she, their family has received a few hundred thousand dollars. So these kind of things are definitely obstacles that uh, impact on African-American health. Um, for one thing, it is definitely responsible for the decrease in African-American vaccine. African-American, a significant portion of my people do not trust the medical community and for good reason. Uh, and so therefore they did not get the vaccine, which impacted all of us to spread the virus more and probably kept the pandemic going for those people who were unvaccinated. Uh, legal racism, we face legal racism every day of our lives, every day of our lives. Black people make up 14% of the population, but black men make up, and women make up almost 40% of the prison population. And you can't say that that's just because black people are criminals. There's something else going on there. And black people are, punished with harsher sentences for the same crimes that white people do. Black people get longer prison sentences, harsher conditions. So of course we don't trust the legal system or the medical system. 
And the other thing that we face is incapacitance on a corporate institution level and on an individual level. Evil will prosper when good people do nothing. So incapacitance and being frozen, not knowing what to do is part of the problem that uh, we definitely have to overcome. But I agree with the previous two speakers, um, particularly um, with Sheena saying that racism impacts um, African-American health in every other phase of our lives. So uh, those are just some of the barriers that I think that we see daily. Dr. Hamer. Thank you. I was looking for my button. Uh, thank you, Rob. I have a- Taylor. I see you not Aaron. <laughs> yes, getting, yes, Dr. Hamer. You're getting a lot of nods. Yeah. Okay, okay. It's going to be a good discussion, I can tell, in our discussion. I think, right I think we're going to have some good questions. I think we are. I think we are. <laughs> Taylor, what kind of okay. barriers with cultural competence do you see affecting your communities? Um, so the first note that I put, um, I think Fadi actually started to, to touch on this, but um, it's just being generalized or put into a group. Um, so, um, and I, I broke this up two ways, cult culturally and geographically. So on a cultural point of view, I mean, when you look into the Latino culture, Kind of like what Fadi said, the languages, the food, the traditions, the ethnicities break down into many, many, many different parts, which are very, very different. And I think as humans, it's just simple and easy for us to want to compact group people into groups just to make it more clear cut. But you, you can't do that. Uh, myself as, you know, a Mexican, I mean, my language and food and and beliefs are different than somebody that's Nicaragua or you know whatever you want to put into the play. Um, for example, I've noticed this a lot the past couple of years as kind of the diversity idea phase has really kicked off. Um, you know, I, I get asked to join boards, and this comment comes up a lot where people are like, "Oh, we're so glad you you agreed to join the board. You're kind of our you're our Latino representation." And I always have to speak up and I'm like, wait a minute. One, I personally, I'm not going to take that on. No, I'm not your Latino representation. I literally cannot represent all the Latino cultures and every point of view. My view is as a 38 year old Mexican who grew up in the old South End, but I have to really kind of put that out there. One, to not accept, I'm not going to accept that. That's not my role, but that's really the statement I get a lot. And it, again, it's just because they want that generalization. Like, well, we have the Latino, we got that point of view. That's one of, of many, many points of view. So I think a barrier and obstacle is being generalized culturally and then also be generalized geographically. Um, you know, the Old South End, unfortunately, from what I hear, it doesn't get a lot of positive comments. So whenever I say, oh, I work in the Old South End or I grew up in the Old South End, Oh my gosh, you work there or what is it like? Or, you know, are you, are you nervous being down there at night? And to think of when maybe a youth or a kid say, you know, I grew up in the old South End or I'm from the old South End, there's like this immediate response that people give and it's not always positive or negative, or it's not always positive. Fortunately, usually it's negative to this area. So again, I think you have to be really careful to just group the old South End together. Um, because there's a lot, a lot of good and creativity in the old South end, especially when you're dealing with youth, because that comment can really make an impact on them for quite a long time. And you don't want to do that. Um, the second obstacle or barrier I put is just, I didn't know how to label it, but I put kind of confusion on how to combine two worlds. So I'm thinking of, you know, kids that maybe students are in the classroom where maybe their parents are coming down first generation moving over to the US and maybe their second, they literally have two different worlds that they are trying to figure out how to maneuver through. They have parents with language and tradition that is very different. I'll, I'll again, give Mexico an example. That's not the only one. Um, and then coming into a classroom where there is kind of a generalized curriculum and historical reference. I mean, that's a lot for a student to really kind of take and process on, okay, when I go to school, this is what I'm learning and this is how I'm taught. And then when I go home, 
<laughs> this is what I'm learning and this is what I'm taught. Um, I'm oh, I always laugh because I took Spanish in high school and I'm, I'm not fluent. I wasn't raised fluent um, because at the time my, my father, he's fluent. Um, he would unfortunately either get beat up or get negative comments. So I was not taught because in his head, you know, he thought that he was going to kind of help me from that. And that's a, a longer story, but, um, but anyways, but I took, I took Spanish in high school and I would always go to my grandma's and I would be so proud, like, oh, here's what I learned. And she'd always turn to me and be like, well, you're talking so proper. What are you saying? Well, the Spanish I was being taught was Castilian Spanish, which is Spain, which is so different than what you're going to you know, learn in Mexico. And I just remember being so excited to say this. And she'd be like, that's not, you're not even saying the right word. Or you're not saying the right. And I was just like, it was, it was hard for me at the time. Like, that's what I'm being taught. But when I go to my family, it's a very different conversation. And that was just something really simple. But I can imagine the students, again, just again, trying to get guidance on how to combine their two worlds together and like work through that. I would think that would be a really large obstacle and barrier. Um, the third one, I can't remember who who touched on this, Gina or Fadi, but really just not being able to see themselves in the curriculum and in the future. So the example with the principal um, and just, I'm sure we all can think of curriculum where maybe we, our groups were not either properly represented or not represented at all, honestly. So I think as students, that's really, really important because the best part of giving a child is giving them the opportunity to see themselves in a different spot. And if they don't even see it in the curriculum they're learning, that's gonna be a barrier on, again, moving out into that future, whether it's a job or a market or industry, their goals, things like that. Um, and then the last one I put, I could see this going towards teachers and students, um, but Sheena touched on this, but just fear of getting it wrong. Um, so when Sheena said that statement, my kid's gay, now what? I think that now what can be a really big obstacle. Half the time we don't really take steps because we're just afraid of getting it wrong. I don't wanna offend anybody. I don't know what to do. Maybe I don't have a resource. I can just honestly ask and have a can candid conversation. Maybe I didn't understand Muslim. I just want to call Fadi and be like, just break it down so I understand, you know, as a female, like how this, how I can help and understand this better. So I think fear all overall could go on the student, but also the teacher that it really can be a barrier on like taking that next step. Um, and you just kind of freeze because you don't know what to do. Um, so I would say generalization, combining your worlds, you can't see yourself in the future and fear of getting it wrong. I just want to say, because you said something about when you mentioned from where you are, the reactions. And so um, I'm not from here, born and raised, I'm a Flintstone. And I remember, and I do this little thing now, even now today when I when I want to. So I go out in the public like, oh, you're from Michigan? Like, yeah, I'm a Michigander. Like, where are you from? I'm like, Flint. They go, oh. But it's funny because people do it here from people from the east side. And it's like, they don't realize just in that moment, now I feel, even if you're not, you're going to judge me, you're going to sterilize, uh, stereotype me, you're going to put me in a box, so my engagement will be totally different. And so that's really important, too, for uh, future educators, your reactions. Like, even if you, like, surprised or just you got to try to work on that because cues are, uh, visual cues are a giveaway to if this, this space is safe for me or not. Thank you. Thank you very much. Fadi, what, what, what would you contribute to this list of barriers and challenges? Yeah, just, just a show of hands. If, if you understand me and my English is uh, pretty good, can you go ahead and raise your hand for me? All right, thank you. That's because I was born and raised here. <laughs> it's my native tongue. <laughs> so a lot of times uh, I get asked, where are you from? Just to go off of that. And I say, I'm born and raised in Toledo, Ohio. And they said, uh, no, like, where are you from? I said, I, Toledo, Ohio, I've pretty, I didn't go many other places. <laughs> like I'm, I'm a Toledo native. I'm, I'm born in Toledo, Ohio. And then uh, born and raised, went to Old Orchard Elementary in the public school system. Uh, moved, experienced a little bit of Sylvania school systems, and th this is where I was born. This is where I was raised. So, 
So when when they say, no, where are you really from? I said, I hope one day I get to visit Jerusalem. That's where my family's from. <laughs> uh, I, I, I hope I can visit that one day, but I'm from Toledo, Ohio. Uh, Toledo, Ohio. Just, that's just to go off of uh, some of the things said. Uh, but let me share a story with you. Uh, I have a student. A lot of our families have a war-torn background. They, they fleed. Palestine, they flee uh, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Kashmir, uh, Myanmar, the Uyghur Muslims, uh, uh, Sudan. There's a really bad civil war happening in Sudan right now, and protests in Sudan, uh, 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 Egypt, just very war torn areas, Iraq. Like I could actually keep going with uh, where they're from and how they're all affected by war. And I have a student that they left Syria, seek refuge at, uh, in Turkey, but because they weren't Turkish citizens, they weren't allowed to uh, participate in the education system there. So the student from fourth grade until eighth grade did not receive an education for four years. And these are formative years, fourth through eighth grade. Then they came to the US uh, as refugees. They went to Arizona based on his age, they placed him in eighth grade. And then he left Arizona, came to Toledo in ninth grade, went to start high school and start just took from Arizona, what Arizona said and put him in ninth grade. So I called the Department of Education looking for solutions. And you know what, oh, they phone webinar just like this. You know what they say to me? The very first thing they said to me was, we just want Mr. Sarsour, we just want to let you know that Ohio does not have a 100% graduation rate. That's how it started. Like, what? How's that conversation? That they're pretty much telling me he's not graduating. Uh, so, so there, there are so many barriers, uh, and the mindset from the top is instead of saying, "Okay, what can we do? What can we change? Why is this a barrier?" It's just to let you know he's probably not going to graduate. That was the that was the solution. So, with the media. That was touched on. Uh, Islamophobia is a real thing. It's a growing industry, and uh, Muslims are looked at as uh, violent support supporters of terrorists. Uh, group of people, they they the media portrays that uh, they're followers of a of a messenger of a prophet that was a war mongering pedophile, which is all all not true. All right. not true. Right. That so, and we can have those discussions, but that's what I want. I want to have those discussions instead of being portrayed that way. There's statistics done by UC Berkeley in this past year that said 88% uh, of Muslim Americans censor what they say because they're afraid of what the repercussions might be. There's another study that showed that 35% of uh, uh, Muslim youth, girl Muslim youth uh, students either got their uh, hijab yanked off or touched or touched inappropriately. Uh, there are other studies that say that 23% of the teachers said, uh, Muslim students said about 23%, 23% uh, reported, sorry, 23% reported that their teachers said something offensive towards Islam or Muslims, or, and then 20% of them said that uh, they didn't even teach the Islamic curriculum. I, I grew up in the school system. When I was in school, when I was in school in Sylvania schools, we there was one chapter on Islam. We spent half a period, and the other half was about the Romans. <laughs> the other half was about the Romans. <laughs> so I, I was so excited that we finally get to speak about me. It wasn't represented correctly. It, 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 what was said in there was not correct. Uh, we have a teacher now that came from Toledo Christian schools. After we spoke and we talked and. Uh, I told her, I gave her a little bit of a Islam 101, if you want to call it. She said, I'm so sorry. She brought me Toledo Christian's curriculum and showed me what it says about Islam, about in, about how uh, how the Prophet Muhammad was a warmonger. He encouraged slavery. None of that, none of that is true. And that's why I'm heavily involved in interfaith dialogue, because I want to build these bridges with my community. This is my community, and I want to build bridges with everyone. And I want to, I, I want to build awareness in, uh, about everything that, 
that, that, that I'm personally witnessing till this day. Uh, my background is actually in uh, biology and exercise science. I was pursuing a PhD in cardiovascular and metabolic disease, uh, diseases at UTMC. Uh, I decided to switch to education because I, I just kept remembering and I, I kept having families telling me about the struggles that their, their kids are going through at school. And I, I had those same exact struggles. Uh, my, my gym teacher called me the Brown Power Ranger during the, during the self-defense unit. Didn't, didn't say about anyone else, calls me the Brown Power Ranger, singles me out. Uh, mm -hmm. I, made a th I used to play basketball and soccer at Southview. I hit a three-pointer. They said, Merry Christmas to me, my coaches. They know I don't celebrate Christmas, but they say Merry Christmas to me. Uh, a lot of the bomb jokes, are you going to hijack the school bus? Are you going to... Are you... Till this day, we have parents mm -hmm. coming to our school at Toledo Islamic Academy saying, please accept our kids at your school. They're still, we're interviewing students. They're saying the same things are still happening to them in our school district, our school districts. We have another family that uh, the, the, one of the students wanted to, without mentioning the school's name, wanted to uh, uh, have a dinner about Palestine and that, that event got canceled. That event got canceled. And then they had to do it at, at a church. So, so I guess the struggles of Islamophobia is a big barrier right now. And it is an industry where a lot of money gets put into it. And uh, as much as we want to look like Aladdin, I look more like Jafar from Aladdin. <laughs> I, I look like the bad guy. <laughs> I, don't, I don't look like, I don't look like uh, Aladdin. Aladdin doesn't even look like many, of, uh, many uh, people from my culture, <laughs> to tell you the truth. Yeah, but that uh, media again. It's that media, yeah. That it's media. It, mm -hmm. Yeah, and then very small percentage. Uh, uh, it, it gives it, it portrays that the majority of, of Muslims are uh, Al Qaeda or ISIS, for instance. Mm -hmm. that, they that is a very 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 small percent. ISIS represents a very small percentage of Muslims, the very minority of Muslims. There are two billion Muslims nearly 2 billion Muslims in the world, 50 of those countries are Muslim majority, and then Muslims are spread throughout the world with different cultures and different communities, but they want to portray us as ISIS, one small group. It doesn't make sense. We have to have these conversations we need to, uh, because, because if we don't have these conversations, I, like, like what I tell uh, a lot of my community members, we're like spiders to, to people in our community. A lot of people don't like spiders because they don't know much about spiders. So what do they do? Instead of trying to get to know the spider, they step on them. So I told them we can't be spiders. We can't be spiders. We have to speak out. We need to start having these dialogues. We need to start building these connections, these bridges, because there, there is violence towards many minority underrepresented communities, including the Muslim community. There's violent attacks, there's verbal attacks, there's bullying in our school systems. Uh, do you know how many times when I have these interfaith dialogues, I tell them that Muslims believe that Jesus is the Messiah of God? And they said, what? You believe Jesus is the Messiah? I said, yeah, it's one of our staple beliefs that Jesus is the Messiah. And they look at me and their questions are always toward women oppression, women rights, violence and terrorism which holds no weight if, if we go over the history of what the prophet muhammad what what women rights he brought in the context of that society what rights he brought to women uh those convers those questions won't be asked but we have to have those conversations and i'm glad you gave me this opportunity to join all of you and i i, I hope anyone that wants to build those bridges reached out to me and we we could we could have our students. Some of you are still in the education system. We could have our uh, students integrate, get to know one another. Thank you. That's wonderful. Uh, and we will follow up on that. I think that Rawe Schumann has some a response. Maybe there is that true, Rawe? <laughs> well, everybody's um, you know generally talking about xenophobia. You know, I mean, whether it's homophobia or mm -hmm. Islamophobia, but basically it's a phobia of people of color or other people than white people. Mm -hmm. And you can see that all the time. So, you know, what Fadi said, what Sheena said, what Taylor said, what I said, um, they fear everybody but white people. And you can see how they treat immigrants. 
Yeah. Just last year, a few months ago, they were running over Haitians and Africans with horses, beating up all the Mexicans and the El Salvadorians, separating them, starving the children, putting them in cages. Europeans want to come here. They open the door. They want to give them benefits, schooling, stipends, everything. I mean, I'm I'm for supporting the Ukrainians, but look how they treat the Ukrainians, and look how they treat Africans, or or Guatemalans, or any people of color. So what all what all yeah. the speakers are saying is xenophobia. They have a definite fear of people of color. Trump even said he don't want uh, people from shithole African countries. He want Norwegians, uh, Europeans. So, you know, I, I agree with everything Taylor and Sheena and Fadi said, and even what Sheena said about the media. Um, I, I agree with everything the speakers have said because it is a psychological onslaught on the black psyche every day. Mm -hmm as Sheena said and some of the other people said. If you look at TV, every day you're gonna hear the phrase, beautiful blonde, am I right? You're gonna hear that every day. Sometimes two, three, four times every day of your life, you're gonna hear the phrase, beautiful blonde on TV or on the radio. So what does that say? That blondes are beautiful and if you're not blonde, you're ugly. And it just goes to the xenophobia that we have to pass a law not to discriminate against black people for their hair. What, what kind of crap is that? I mean, it just shows over and over the xenophobia, which mm -hmm. Biden has talked about, uh, which Sheena's talked about, and which Taylor's talked about, and I've talked about. So I agree with the, with my colleague panelists. Thank you. I could tell that you had a way to sum this up for us. <laughs> yes, I, well, we, we were all on the same page, absolutely. absolutely. What Biden said, Islamophobia. Whenever you see a Muslim on TV, he got a hair scarf on and he's a terrorist. Every mm -hmm. time. You never see a good Muslim on TV. They're always terrorists. They got an AK-47. They got a hair scarf and they're that stereotypic African. I mean, yeah. uh, Arab, excuse me. So it, it is xenophobia. So I, I don't want to go too long, but that Great. sums up how I feel. And I can see that Sheena also is itching to say something. So I'm going to <laughs> so much, so much. Oh my I want to have you start the, our next round out, though, please, um, because we're getting into this. I believe our, yes. our our final question is: What do you wish teachers, and especially those of us who are teaching teachers to be teachers, because you are talking to the College of Education? Yes. What do you want uh, teachers and us to know and practice? in order to be culturally competent and in order to be putting out teachers who are culturally competent. And all of you have alluded to this a bit, but Gina, will you start mm -hmm. us off? So, so I, I did write this one down, Taylor. See, I did a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I wrote down, beware of cultural blindness. Um, mm. When supporting individual and or student, make sure to be aware and value the multiple identities that they share within and not choose the one that makes you feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. So often when we're talking about DEI, it's usually just black and white. Um, and then if you wanna get a little spicy, we might put LGBT in it, but it's so many layers. It's poverty, it's economical, it's gender identity, sexual orientation. Um, and then you also have to be careful for seeing face value, what you think is their identity. Um, because when you was talking, um, I literally thought about the challenges I had uh, raising a bicultural son. My my son is uh, black and Middle Eastern, and immediately everyone thought once I disclosed that that we were Muslim, and I was like, why why would you think because he's Middle Eastern that he's Muslim? That's that's not the same thing. But because we're trained and not educated enough about different cultures, different backgrounds, we assume, you know. Um, I remember I'm gonna be very trained because you know doctor i am very open with my mistakes because we all grow from them when mm -hmm. i was here, i was very sheltered with diversity it was just black people we had one family called the browns and they were black and white that was it that was my you know view or whatever. when i came here i wasn't really uh educated on different latina hispanic cultures and i was taught they speak Spanish. That's Mexican. That's it. Trust me, I got proven and told up and down, though I am in trouble. Uh, 
Thank God today, me and Tammy are friends after she cussed me out. But because we're not exposed, <laughs> and now you have an education system that is making it that way. Because think about it, if we keep learning um, about each other, then we can unite and fight white supremacy. They don't want that. They want to make sure I, I stay scared uh, of Fadi. They want to make sure that I... I think, you know, Taylor is ghetto because she's from the South side. They want to make sure those things happen, you know, or I'm going to touch or harm your kids because I'm queer. They want to make sure that those things happen because uh, we can't unite. But back to the question. Sorry. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to try to. I, just, <laughs> um, I really want to make sure that we be aware of cultural blindness because we do it a lot. So right now in the queer community, everybody's putting their pronouns up or on the emails, that's great. But are you uh, addressing that I'm a person with disabilities? Are you addressing I am a person, you know, uh, that's a mother that needs time to go and get kids food or whatever? Like, make sure that just because you see this one identity, that's what you don't hold on to when you're walking with students. Um, because you once again get lost in the weeds of, okay, my child, the student came out as trans. So now I got to make sure they use the bathroom that's in the janitor's closet. Did you ask them what bathroom they want to use? Boom. You know, because you are, are woke. That they, they, they feel comfortable yet doing that step. Um, you put in the pressures of your wokeness on them. So be careful of that. Um, make sure that you listen to what they need. Yes, you may you may know all 64 sexual orientations, but maybe they're still trying to find a new one for themselves. And that's fine. Um, so you have to be very careful of being culture blind, but also being culturally woke because when we really woke, we're just asleep. Um, and that's that's pretty much my thing where when it comes to the queer community, uh, we have so much information going on and everybody wants to do the right thing, which is great, and I'm loving it. But make sure you don't um, create that barrier yourself trying to push on them what you think is queer. Thank you. And I uh, did not give a lineup here. Let's have uh, uh, Taylor, Fadi, and then we'll end up with Rahway. Okay. okay. Um, so I'm thinking about future teachers, you know, to know in practice, um, you know, first I thought about um, kind of envisioning your classroom, maybe what that be traditional or non-traditional, but first clarify your own self, your own beliefs. What do you want your classroom to stand for? And again, classroom in a broad text, because I guarantee you this cultural competency, this is deep and it's hard and it's icky and it's uncomfortable but you need to be really grounded in you of, as a teacher in his classroom, what do I believe in? What are my traits and my beliefs? What do I want my students to take away from me as just an individual teacher? So when you get into those really hard situations, you can look at that list. And sometimes it's just super simple. We forget that we just wanna be honest and safe and trustworthy. And we come up with all these equations of answers. And if we just look at that list, which is the honest and trustworthy thing to do here? It's really simple. I don't need to think of all these different things, but I mean, I'm suggesting like literally write it down in your classroom. What do you want to stand for? So when you get in those situations, you can almost remind yourself because it, it can get hard. Um, the second one, um, relationships and communicate. Find and develop relationships that you can have these really frank conversations with. People that you can trust and say, I'm really trying to dig deeper into this topic. I need you to help me. And maybe they won't respond with like offense or skepticism, like they're understanding. I'm just really trying to better myself. Relationships and communicate. When we are talking about, sometimes we don't react out of fear. So for example, uh, maybe a certain group we're hearing is not comfortable coming into the Sophia Cathedral Center. And we're all trying to think of what can we do to make this group feel comfortable. Sometimes I laugh and I'm like, why don't we just go ask them? Just ask them what we can do to make it feel comfortable. Like, <laughs> it's crazy how we don't think of that. We will go through all this stuff, mm -hmm. like, pick up the phone and let's just have a conversation. What mm -hmm. can I do to help? One, that puts, you know, a little bit of pressure off, but two, it gives them that power that I now, okay, I can share then. You do want to hear from me. So I would say relationships, 
and communicate. Um, I won't get too in deep in this one because Sheena, but I put don't put a blanket over uncomfortability. Again, this is an uncomfortable topic. Um, it's a great topic, but sometimes again, we tend to tap. We want to step back because it does get uncomfortable. Don't be, you know, don't want to put a blanket to just like quiet it down. You know, again, bring it up, talk about it. Um, and all I got to do is say, I mean, I commend you guys. It, this is not easy work by any means. We're all giving suggestions as panelists. This is hard, but it's very important. But this will take time in your classroom and this will take work and this will take resources. And so all I can do is encourage you to keep pushing that but i am all not trying to minimize that this is a lot but it's just as important you know as any other topic um so with that i'll wrap up thank you so much sheena over to you or no i'm sorry uh, Fadi, over to you i got confused Fadi. yeah i think first off uh try to recognize any biases or stereotypes you might have about other groups of people uh after that try to uh do your homework from reliable sources, learn the histories of uh, other groups. Uh, then I would say uh, be aware of your subconsciousness because even though if you don't if you don't think you're um, uh, a racist person, uh, sometimes your subconscious comes out and especially in times of fear and stress, so really recognize your subconsciousness and build awareness of yourself. Then after that, uh, students just want to be treated fairly, regardless of the group. They, they want to be treated with justice and with fairness. So establish a community uh, in your classroom. Uh, set the ground rules, ha have the students, uh, give, the, give the students uh, some autonomy in those ground rules. Uh, uh, do not pick one group of students more than others. Have equal weight on uh, how to establish the classroom. Uh, don't be shy to ask if, if do you feel like you're being represented uh, in your classroom. Uh, have those conversations with students. Uh, try try to try to be even handed. Just students love consistency. They love fairness, and they love a teacher, anytime they see a teacher that is fair and consistent, regardless who you are, uh, you're going to have a good relationship with that student, regardless if you're strict or not strict. So I promise you, if you're just consistent and fair and even handed with all of your students, no matter what group they come from, they, they, will, they will love you as a mentor and as a teacher and as an educator. And then uh, the last thing I would say, Toledo Islamic Academy, I said it many times, we're your neighbor. Uh, we have many licensed teachers. Uh, reach out to us. Let's, let's have some of the teachers get placed in our schools and let them, let them uh, we have very good mentors. I learned my mentor at that school uh, when I first started, he taught at Toledo Public Schools for 20 years, has his PhD. Uh, we have many PhDs at the school and we have many license, Ohio licensed teachers at the school. So reach out to us. Uh, let's, let's place some student teachers at Toledo Islam Academy and learn uh, and kind of learn the culture of, uh, of, of the Muslims and all the ethnicities represented in the Muslim community. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's amazing that my colleagues and I are in such agreement. Um, I, I would say that um, the first thing that um, teachers should know and practice to be culturally competent is to identify your position or your stage on the cultural competence continuum. Where are you on that continuum? Find that spot and then make a concerted effort to move advance along that continuum. So identify where you are on the cultural competence, identify where you are and start there and advance along the curriculum. So that's the first thing I would say. The second thing I would concur with my fellow panelists that you should know thyself. Know thyself, that's an ancient Egyptian adage. Know thyself, uh, search yourself for those biases conscious or unconscious um, and if you find them get rid of them but the main thing i want to say to teachers and to the teachers of teachers you have a sacred obligation 
to seek and teach the truth above all else uh, because you have the future of the country in your hands the future leaders the future doctors scientists musicians whatever it would all be impossible without a teacher so a teacher to me has a sacred obligation and the university a university is a place that attracts attracts the best and the brightest in my opinion and i believe that professors teachers of teachers and teachers themselves uh, must be honest and fair as Fadi and um, Taylor and Sheena has said. But the thing that bothers me now in, in closing is in education and in general is this move towards censorship. That is really disturbing to me uh, that the majority culture, basically Eurocentric culture, wants to censor um, true history, the 1619 project. There's a move to censor that project because it talks about the brutality of slavery beginning in 1619. Um, that, that is really scary to me because um, when you start to censor other people's opinion, that is the first step towards autocracy and a dictatorship. That is the first step. So teachers are on the vanguard against tyranny and dictatorship. And that's a sacred, uh, most, most important obligation. Um, this whole notion of critical race theory. Now, what the hell is critical race theory? Is it just teaching the truth about the brutality of American history? Yes, it is. Is it is anything in critical race theory untrue? No, it's not. So the majority culture is telling all of us people of culture that they don't want to talk about the criminal brutality that they've done to us and they don't want us to talk about it. They don't want to talk about it, and they don't want you to talk about it. All they want to talk about is Europe and France and England and Russia. They don't want to talk about Saudi Arabia, Iran, Africa, people of color. As Fadi said, there's maybe a half a chapter on Islam. There may be one chapter on Africa out of a whole history book. So the, the my, my final message is, to teachers and to teachers of teachers, seek and teach the truth. Resist this increasing notion of censorship. Resist that. I know it's a threat to you and your job because if they pass laws, if you don't teach what they say to you, they can fire you. That's a question of consciousness and value. But I would just encourage teachers and professors to teach and seek the truth. Dr. Hamer. Thank you so much. Wonderful panel. Let's give them a virtual round of applause. Uh, we are going to break up rooms to have discussion. And as, as Mr. Schumann said, it's a good thing there is so much commonality. Uh, I think that our speakers, um, who will each be placed in one room, uh, or I'm sorry, in different rooms, let me be quiet. Aaron, you take over. This is your part. That's why I can't talk. <laughs> Well, thank you for putting up that slide. Um, this is fantastic. I just want to start by saying that I've spent the last year plus trying to effectively quantify uh, cultural competence. And for me to uh, hear your experiences and your definitions um, reminded me of why I was so I am so invested in doing the kind of research that I do and, and understanding the things that I that I want to understand. Um, so overall, uh, what, among the things that I heard from all of you is that cultural competence means, and this is just a very quick uh, uh, overview. It means being adaptable. It means understanding the the historical and cultural co uh, context of, of oppressed and marginalized people. Um, it means listening, active listening. It means treating people as individuals with dignity and, and justly. Those are a few of the things of many of the, the things that, that you all said that I think are really important. What we want to do for the next 15 minutes or so is to reflect on the things that you all have taught us and shared with us 
and uh, figure out how we can apply that as uh, faculty and staff um, at the, the Judith Herb College of Education to improve our work. So for the next 15 minutes, I, um, there are two questions that we want people to ponder and respond to in the breakout group. The first is, what are the opportunities that we have to develop enhanced cultural competence in Judith Herb College of Education? And what are the threats to or weaknesses in our college's cultural competence that we need to address with a sense of urgency? Um, and I just, so Rawe, I want to say, I was, I was nodding very hard when you were speaking. <laughs> I know, I saw you. <laughs> One of the reasons that I was is that, um, well, you were speaking, uh, your uh, talk really resonated with my, with me and my experiences, but one thing in particular- I know, I know, we're both black men. My both, my father was a surgeon and my mother a nurse. And even after all of their training and living their lives mm -hmm. in uh, the medical profession, mm -hmm. neither of them trust the medical profession at all. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. that, that's how <laughs> profound uh, the the impact of some of the things that you're discussing are yes. My mother yes. to this day, she just she resists. She will not see doctors, even though she's worked with them for fifty years. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Yes. So I didn't yes. know I have a chance to share that with you. So I want to say that. So having said all <laughs> that, yes, I think it's it's time for us to go into those breakout rooms and um, we we'll try to mindful of the time, it, just a little bit more than five minutes on each question. And the people who are moderating into the, the rooms are gonna try to keep notes uh, so that we can share with, well, through the, the diversity community to the, the college and, and so forth. So thank you for that. And I'll turn it back over to you, Lynn. Um, and I will I guess, turn it over to our mastermind, Josh. Will you magically <laughs> turn us to our breakout rooms? We are now back to the point where I will turn it over to Dr. Racy Kumar to give us a few concluding thoughts and uh, uh, wrap us up for today. Thank you, and thank you for such a wonderful and thought provoking session. It was just amazing. Thank you, Roy Schumann, Taylor Marciega. Fadi Sarsour and uh, Sheena Barnes for sharing your insights regarding what you think are important for us to know and to become more culturally competent as we serve our students in our communities. And we really appreciate your, all the work that you have you've been doing as cultural ambassadors for your community. And there are several things, you know, when we went out to the breakout session, I had to actually go back and see what are all the wonderful things that you had said. And there was just so such a range of issues you covered and it was really thought provoking. You, we talked about building awareness, embracing our roots, and it, there, was, there were conversations about becoming more open-minded, about uh, being respectful of different ways of thinking, and importantly, that we should be willing to learn from our students. And then, of course, as we become more multicultural, cultural, as you pointed out, it's not one size fits all. And I think we, re we are really taking it to heart, all the things that you have told us. And uh, several other things, indeed, about religion. When you talked about religion, I was just thinking how wonderful it was. And really, all religions have this common message of love and of respect. And that, and you also reminded us in your presentations that diversity, when you talk about religion or you talk about cultural groups, they are diverse. And there is a variability within these groups. And we should always keep that in mind. And of course, one of the things that uh, uh, resonated with me, because I too am an immigrant, is that uh, is the conversation that was there when you said confusion about, about how you combine two worlds. And indeed, much of my early work was how do how do we adjust when our home life and school lives are like two different worlds? That literally was my dissertation, and and so it really resonated with me, and I enjoyed it. And of course, well, in, there were many important issues that came up, include the systemic racism that is present in uh, 
in our institutions and of course in our color in our curriculum as well and we need to bear that in mind as we when we as faculty go into our classrooms to do right by our students all our students uh, who are who we are here to serve and uh, and of course there was so much sage advice and of course and i don't need to repeat all the things that all of you presented so eloquently we do take it to heart and uh, we will certainly keep your presentations in mind and examine our own strengths and weaknesses and seek opportunities to enhance how culture you know how we can become culturally competent as a collective and i love this statement we have a sacred obligation to seek and teach the truth and we do take it to heart and we will make sure that we live by that uh, by that statement i think that was really important and we thank you for all that and in the spirit of promoting diversity in all its manifestations and our promote and our own efforts to promote equity and social justice i thank all of you presenters personally and of course on behalf of the diversity committee and uh, thank you also to dr dean witty for uh, making it possible for us to have sessions such as this it has been the most inspiring uh, inspiring session one of the most inspiring sessions i've been to so thank you all and oh yes i shouldn't forget please do remember to join us again tomorrow we have two really interesting sessions uh, we are going to be meeting with uh, uh, with representatives from our uh, schools which are in our neighborhood, and of course there is the evaluation that is there in the. I think the you have the connection on the in the chat. Make sure you complete the evaluation, and everyone who does so will receive. You'll receive a $15 certificate of G for Jira's Heavenly Sweets. And then there is also a, a, a raffle drawing. So please, please do remember to, uh, to complete those evaluations because that also will tell us how, what we have done well and where we need to improve. So thank you all and look forward to seeing you tomorrow. And thank you so much, Tracy. I want to, before people jump off, I just now put the link in the chat. It wasn't actually my job, but I was able to find it. <laughs> um, so do uh, click on that link for the survey. Uh, we really need to hear from you. We will have everybody's email. And so um, in the spirit that uh, Fadi Sastru said, we need to keep working together. We will communicate. Um, the other links in the session here are to register for tomorrow if you want to look in the chat. So thank you all so very much. Thank you. This was amazing. Thank you. Have a good Thank you. Uh, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you, everyone. Bye. See you tomorrow. Okay. Yep. Thank you. See you tomorrow. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye now. So long.